Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, my name is Fritz Klassner. I'm the Natural Resource Program Manager with the Office of Mauna Kea Management. Uh, and tonight uh, we have Dr. Evan Rem, who's a postdoctoral uh, student, or not student, but postdoc at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, working with the Institute of Pacific Island Forestry and with Hakalau uh, uh, Forest National Wildlife Refuge, looking at uh, forest, re what the influences on forest restoration and how forest is restoring over the years. Um, and, and with that, um, we have a lay for Dr. Rem, and I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. But I think yeah. the other thing to mention is, um, if I'm not mistaken, you're headed back to California here pretty soon? No, I'm based out of oh, the okay. Hilo office, but I got a full-time job. I'm moving to Tennessee in okay. two months. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, part of this was um, <laughs> that I check in before we head out. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, Can we get a license? Here. Okay. Right. Well, thanks for inviting me and really happy to be here to be able to share the work we've been doing for the last couple years up on Mauna Kea, about midway between shoreline and summit. So this is good for that. Um, I want to start by saying that this is sort of the culmination of, of two years of research that we've been doing in Hakalau Forest National Wildlife Refuge. That started long before I ever got here. Um, Stephanie Elenik and uh, Carla D'Antonio at UC Santa Barbara. Stephanie's at USGS here on, on island. They've been doing research there for quite a long time and laid a lot of the groundwork for the project we have. Um, and this is a large collaborative grant with a lot of local and national partners. Um, so at UH Manoa, Stanford, other folks at UC Santa Barbara, as well as our local on-island partners. I just want to say the work we're doing is actually still ongoing. We're wrapping up some experiments now. So the things I'm going to talk about could potentially be changing as I start analyzing the data and pulling it together. So a lot of what we have here is preliminary. And as anybody knows, projects like this don't get done without really good field research teams. And so there's a lot of them in the room tonight. I need to acknowledge them and thank them for all the hard work they've done. I get to stand up here and present it. That's the easy part. They got to go out and collect it. That's the hard part. Um, and before I get into the details of our site-specific research, I want to put it into a broader context of biodiversity and global climate change. So I'm really interested in things like fruits and seeds and interactions with insects and birds, how that all comes together at a community level. Um, and so I'm really interested in biodiversity and the processes that conserve those bi that biodiversity. Unfortunately, we're really good at destroying biodiversity and changing the landscape. So through things like um, man-made climate change and over-harvesting of resources and introduction of invasive species and habitat loss, we've destroyed a lot of biodiversity. And we're so good at doing this, we've created the sixth mass extinction on the globe. Books have been written about it. We've now entered a new geologic age, which is defined by the human footprint on the landscape. So we're altering the environment at really rapid rates. So as an ecologist, one of the biggest challenges I face is trying to understand the response of these natural ecosystems to this ongoing global change. And that's a big challenge that we as a whole are facing as a society and as a science as well. Um, I work largely in tropical forests, and this holds a large portion of biodiversity in the world. This is lowland <coughs> tropical forests as well as tropical forests that occurs on islands like here in Hawaii. And what we see in a lot of tropical forests is a cycle of taking intact tropical forest. We deforest it, um, maybe take some timber products off of there, but usually that deforestation in the tropics is to convert it to agricultural land. Often this is to convert it into pasture land for ungulate grazing, cows, sheep, goats, things like that. When we do this, we introduce exotic grasses and non-native grasses. So now you've gone from intact tropical forest to an actively gra grazed pasture, which in a lot of tropical systems only last for a little time. Social systems shift, economic shift, the land becomes marginal, and it's no longer actively grazed or used for agriculture. And at this point, based on ecological succession theory, that abandoned pasture, which is dominated by invasive grasses, could secede back to intact tropical forest. Or you could use restoration as a way to speed up that process and make sure it goes down that pathway back to intact tropical forest. But as an ecologist and as a practicing conservation biologist, we know that that last step is also really hard to accomplish in certain systems, especially in a place here like Hawaii. And that's because there's a lot of different barriers that prevent native woody plants from invading these grassland-dominated systems. 
I list a couple here that we're working on in Hawaii, but there could be a lot of different um, barriers depending on the system you're working in, such as fire or floods or other things like that. And overcoming these barriers and getting forests back on the landscape are really important in island systems because we all know there's incredibly unique biodiversity in a lot of island systems. So it's a very small proportion of the Earth's land mass, yet a lot of extinctions happening on islands because they're very sensitive to changes in the environment. And a lot of the remaining threatened and endangered species that exist on the landscape exist on islands, um, yet we're changing islands fairly rapidly. And you may have heard Hawaii is called the extinction capital of the world. So this is sort of the epicenter for trying to get native species back on the landscape and preserving and protecting native species. Let's put this into perspective of the 1,225 endangered species on the US endangered species list, about 481 of them are from here, even though it's a very small proportion of the land mass of the US. So overcoming this barrier of going from abandoned pasture back to intact tropical forest is really important on island systems and especially important here in Hawaii. And there's a lot of potential to restore forests on the islands. Here's an image of the big island. A um, little hard to see here, but these green polygons represent actively grazed land in the 1980s and then again in 2015. And I highlight some areas that are no longer being actively grazed during that, um, as of 2015. That doesn't mean there's not ungulates out there. It just means that it's not actively being managed by a rancher or a farmer or something like that. So there's potential to change these actively grazed pastures, which are covered in non-native species, back to intact tropical forests. And obviously I'm going to focus in on one of these. This is Hakala Forest National Wildlife Refuge. I think a lot of people in this room are probably familiar with it where it is, but in case you're not, here's the Big Island of Hawaii. We're going to zoom in on this thing that looks, here's the outline of Hakala. Looks like a pair of shorts and a sock sticking out. Mauna Kea is here on your left. And you can see some dark bands here of dark green. This is really good intact native tropical forest. Some of the best we have left in the island system. But we're going to zoom into the track that we're working on and look at this part over here. This is the area that was cleared back in the 19, or back in the 1800s to put cows on the landscape um, and was grazed for 100, 150 years and then subsequently abandoned sometime in the 70s or 80s. And so this is the area where active restoration is occurring. So a large proportion of Hakala is pretty good native forest and that's great. Um, and I'll get into why this area up here is really important. So you can see the, the boundary of Hakalau here. This is essentially the Mana Road that wraps around Waimea, if you've ever been up there. It sort of parallels right along that road. And I'm going to zoom in on this section right here where we're working. So this is a different image, um, but you can see this is the upper boundary of the refuge here in red. On the right hand side, we have intact native forest and there's a remnant fence line that's still there today. This fence was erected to protect the watershed further downstream. And so grazing didn't really occur in this area. So this is fairly in intact, untouched native forest. Whereas outside of that fence line is where the cows were and where the forest was cleared. And so US Fish and Wildlife Service has been really interested in this area, this upper area of Hakala Forest, because it represents a big opportunity to restore some forest in a really important area for a lot of the unique native birds we have here. Um, this area is at an elevation about 1,600 to 2,000 meters above sea level, which means it's cold enough that mosquitoes don't necessarily persist there all year round. And if you know anything about the birds and mosquitoes, you know that avian malaria is uh, very prevalent all over the islands up to a certain elevation. So it's cold enough in these restoration areas that mosquitoes don't really persist and avian malaria isn't necessarily there all year round. And so this could potentially be a, a place where the birds could go do their thing and not be stressed out with avian malaria, which eventually leads to their death. So Fish and Wildlife Service was interested in restoring this and they've done a pretty good job at doing that. And the way they did restoration starting back in the 1980s was this is now from the east looking up here is Mauna Kea. We have sort of the intact forest boundary down here with some fragmented forest. You can see some of these lines of green. These are planted corridors of koa trees, all koa trees. But you can see they're all over the landscape. And what they hoped would happen was that as you plant those trees and they grow up, they would expand further outwards and coalesce into a larger contiguous chunk of forest and the other native plant species would come in there. We can follow these corridors through time. I know it's a little hard to see this far away, 
you can see some of these corridors of koa trees that are planted on the um, on the image here in 2004, about 15 years after restoration began, so these trees are about 15 years old. Ten years later, you can see those corridors starting to get a bit bigger, but what you don't see is the filling in between those corridors. So the grassland that occurs between those corridors is still out there and not really being overrun by forests. Regardless, those cold corridors have been really beneficial to bird populations. So what we have here is three different species of birds. I'm going to focus on these two first, the Eevee and the Elliopio. Um, this is a paper uh, by Evan Paxton at USGS. The panel under that, underneath represents year on the y-axis or on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is distance from intact forest. Think of that: the further you go up that vertical axis, the further away you are getting from the intact forest, and the further into those restoration corridors you're going. So over time, we can start to see things like the Eliopio really start to increase their presence and abundance further and further into those restoration corridors, further and further up the mountain. Same area of the EV a little bit. But note that there, these two species feed on things like nectar and insects, so flowers and insects. So there's a lot of that out there on these koa trees, because there's the structure and koas produce a lot of flowers. But notice the omao, which is the um, frugivorous bird on this island that eats fruits. It's not necessarily increasing as much much in these restoration corridors. And a large part of that is because when you go into those restoration corridors today, this is what they look like. You have koa trees that are starting to form a closed canopy, but the understory is almost all invasive non-native grasses. So the fruit isn't there for those omao. We're missing this really incredibly diverse and unique understory plant community that historically would have been in this um, forested region up here. And so our research now comes in to try to say, well, what is preventing these other native plants from being out on the landscape? Fish and Wildlife Service has now switched from planting koas to outplanting these understory plants, but that only goes so far. You can only do that in certain areas. It takes a lot of time. It's a lot of effort. It's a good education outreach tool, but it's not necessarily um, going to result in the entire place being covered in the understory plants. So we wanted to sort of think about how could this happen at a bigger scale? Uh, before I go too much further into the um, details of the studies that we're doing, I want to talk a little bit more about the system. I think most people in this room are probably fairly familiar with it, so I'm sorry if this is sort of a review for you. But when you go into the forest in this elevation and in this side of the island, you notice that the canopy is made up of two main species. We have koa, which is fast growing, fairly easy to grow, easy to propagate, and that's why it's used in a lot of restoration projects, because you can get big trees on the landscape relatively quickly. But it's also a nitrogen fixer, which I'll come back to towards the end of the talk. The other species on the landscape is ohia, um, the other one that forms the canopy. It's slower growing, a little harder to propagate, so it's not really used as often in restoration projects, at least that I know of on this, on this side of the island. Um, but when you go into a native intact forest, it's much more dominated by ohia than it is by koa. There's way more big ohia trees in the canopy than there are koa trees. And what we also see is on this landscape of once the forest is cleared, but some koa and some ohia are left, we start to see a lot more understory plants under ohia, and you don't really see them under koa. And so that's also an important part about this. I'll go into a little bit of terminology real quick. So when I say intact forest, I mean this forest that's to the right or to the east of the remnant fence line that has had minimal grazing, if any grazing at all, and is a, is a really nice forest. And to the left is restoration area. This includes the koa corridors. This includes includes some big old ohias that were left on the landscape, and this includes that grassland matrix. And then within the restoration area, we have two different habitat types. There's the koa corridors. It's a little hard to see, but these are these linear features up here towards the top of the image. And then there's remnant ohia that were left on the landscape when they cleared the forest, presumably to provide shade for the cows that were out there on that landscape. And most of these ohia are several hundred years old, so they're big, old, really cool looking trees. And they're embedded in, now embedded in this grassland koa matrix. And so they also give us a little insight of what um, potential is there for these ohias. So coming back to this big question of what is preventing uh, restoration of other native plants within these koa corridors, I want to work down through some of the projects we have going on that look at our different barriers to restoration. So again, we're trying to think about how can we move from an abandoned pasture back to an intact tropical forest. We've already got a jump start on that. The koa trees are out there. Those are native plants starting to form a forest. But why aren't we seeing the other plants come in? So we're going to look at this in depth, one by one. And again, I'm going to give you more of a broad overview of each of these projects. 
Um, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty about statistics and data. I want to sort of give you the bigger take home messages about what we're finding on these projects and not bore you with all the details of these. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the potential lack of seed dispersal. In order to get a plant, you need a seed, right? So potentially there's no plants, these other plants aren't coming in because you're not getting the seed. Right? And in order for a seed to arrive, especially from the ones that produce fleshy fruits, generally in the Hawaiian Islands, birds consume those fruits, they ingest the seed, they fly off somewhere, they poop it out, and then that seed, wherever it lands, could potentially grow into its own plant. That seed dispersal in a nutshell. So we wanted to look at um, if that's actually actually happening within these restoration corridors. The idea being, uh, well now we have uh, the native Ama'o is one of the, the few seed dispersers. Um, the Alala is also a seed disperser, but it didn't occur in this area historically. So the Ama'o is about the only native seed disperser um, in the system. And then we have uh, two invasive species, the red-billed Leothrix and the Japanese white-eye, which are potentially eating fruit dispersing seeds as well. Um, a thought is, is that if you have canopy trees, you could have birds, any one of these, coming in with those seeds in their gut and moving seeds into that system. When they poop out those seeds, it could potentially grow into a, a native shrub. That's a positive benefit for that native shrub community. Over time, those native shrubs start to become adults, and they start to produce their own fruits, which has a positive effect on the bird community. It brings more birds in because now there's more fruit. And so you start to get this positive feedback loop of Increasing understory, increasing birds, increasing seed dispersal. The other uh, pathway or the other option here is that birds are bringing those seeds in, but when they deposit them into that grassy matrix, the seed dies or it can't germinate or it can't establish for whatever reason. So you don't start to get that native plant understory and it has a negative feedback on those birds because a bird that needs to eat fruit, why would it move into a system where the fruit doesn't exist, right? So a first step to, to sort of get at this question is, first of all, is there any seed coming into this system? And so this is seed rain data from um, prior to when I started here that Evan Paxson and Stephanie Elenick collected. What we're looking at is seed rain in the intact forest and in the, in the restoration area and seed rain under Koa and Ohia. Basically, we put these traps out about this big with nets in the bottom of them. They collect any seed that falls in them. We can identify it, sort it, and sort of quantify how much seed is entering that system. And what we see is there's actually quite a bit of seed falling in those restoration corridors, whether it's a big old ohia, under a big old ohia or under a, a, a newer koa. But what we see is some important compositional shifts. So chirodendron trigynum, that's a lapa, is really abundant in the seed rain in the intact forest, but in the restoration corridor, it's this dark bar here on the bottom, it's really not present. And we start to see a lot of Rubus argutus, which is an invasive raspberry species, which is all over the mountainside up here it starts to become really abundant in the seed rain in that restoration area. So this means birds are moving seeds around and moving seeds into that system. It's just sometimes they're moving invasive species, sometimes they're moving native species, and the species they're moving are sort of a subset of what's in the intact forest. But this is a good start. We know some seeds are coming in. So let's take this a step further. Once those seeds come in, what happens to those seeds? Potentially, they have to compete with that invasive grass layer in order to grow and survive. So we wanted to do an experiment where we sort of manipulate seed rain as well as manipulate the grass layer at the same time. You can imagine, I'm going to show you the experimental design setup real quick. You can imagine we're in the air looking down through the canopy of trees. These are both koa and ohia that are in that restoration area. We did this under nine trees of koa, under nine trees of ohia. And what we did was under the crown, under each of these trees that are out there, we manipulated grass density. So we either didn't touch the grass, so there's still 100% grass cover on the ground. We took about half of that grass away, so there's 50% of grass, or we took all the grass away, so it's 0% grass. And this is what it looks like on the ground. Here's our 0%. We go in with a weed whacker and continually with scissors cut this away. 50% um, grass, same thing, and 100% grass, we just leave it. There's tons and tons of grass out there. Then on top of that, you can see these different subplots inside this bigger plot of grass removal. We can manipulate seed rain. So how much seed comes into that system? We're adding 0, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200 seeds of each of the understory species to try to tease apart what's more important, seed rain or grass competition. 
to give you an idea, the amount of seed coming into a similar sized um, plot would be about one to 10 seeds per year, depending on which species you're looking at, understory species. So we're adding sometimes 10 to 100 to 200 times more seeds than you would get normally. So we're really increasing seed rain. And again, on the ground, this is what it looks like. We have our different grass removal plots, but now we've manipulated the amount of seed that's inside those plots. So I'm not gonna, again, I'm not gonna go into the, the nitty gritty details or the species specific details of this. I wanna talk about sort of broader community level patterns that we're seeing. Where does recruitment occur um, under these different plants? Well, what we see is that there's higher recruitment under ohia than under koa. So the plants that are not being used in the restoration are the ones that actually have better recruitment under them. We also see that we get higher recruitment when grass is removed. Well, that's not super surprising, but if you don't touch the grass and you dump hundreds of seeds onto a spot, you start to get establishment. That was a little surprising to us, but again, not super surprising. You throw enough seeds into a space, one bound to survive and grow. What was really surprising to me was that removing half of the grass is actually good enough. So if you can thin that grass out somehow, whether it's mechanically like we're doing or shade it out or treat it somehow, that seems to be good enough to get a lot of these seeds started because now you have a, an open space where there was once grass that these seeds can land on the soil and start to grow. But what this tells us is that under current conditions in these color corridors, Recruitment probability is pretty low because first of all, any seed that comes into this area is competing with grass. And second of all, there's not that many seeds entering into the system. So combined, we're li really limiting the potential for these native understory plants to get in there and grow. So we're starting to show that there are these different barriers to forest restoration. But what about lack of other plant establishment sites? Think of this as areas potentially that are not covered in grass. They're few and far between up there, but there are some out there. Can seeds reach these other, um, these other areas on the ground and potentially grow on these would be good establishment sites. For this study, we're looking at um, just these remnant ohia. We're gonna ignore those koa for now because we know they're bad recruitment sites. We hardly see any native plants under them. So let's look at these remnant ohia where we do see uh, native plants starting to come in. And like I said, these trees are, a lot of them are several hundred years old. They were all covered in grass when the grazing was happening because the cows were in there tearing everything up. So when the cows were removed in the 1980s, all of the trees started out with a grassy understory. But now, 30 years later, some trees still have just 100% grass near the base of them, but other ohia trees have a ton of understory plants under them 30 years later. Even though they both started at the same time, some have a lot of native understory plants, others don't. So we wanted to try to figure out why this could possibly be. What can explain why some trees have it and some trees don't? So this is work we did with a Hawaiian student from Colorado State University and um, another student in our lab at UC Santa Barbara to look at a lot of different variables to try to explain the variation we're seeing in understory plant recruitment under these ohia trees. We looked at things like the distance they are from a forest. We looked at things like the distance they are from a fence line. Where's their nearest neighbor? What other plants are around them? We took all sorts of tree level variables. How big are they? How big is the crown? How big are the roots? All sorts of stuff. At the end of the day, we could only get two variables that started to explain why some trees have understory development and others don't. One is that tall trees tend to have more understory plants under them. We don't really know why this is. It could be potentially because birds like to use tall trees for perching and singing, or they might nest in them, or they might just be visible on the landscape. A bird can see a tall tree and not a short tree. So there might be higher seed grain under them. The second part is that trees with basal structures, and so this is buttressing of roots, elongated roots, uh, uh, a base that's really odd and close to the ground, a branch that fell over, started to grow again. Um, they tend to have a lot more seedlings in and around them. So these are woody structures close to the ground. And what we also noticed when we did this study was that a lot of those basal structures were also covered in bryophytes. Now, bryophytes are mosses, liverworts, mm -hmm. and hornworts. Um, I knew nothing about bryophytes until last year when we started this study. So don't be ashamed if you didn't know what a bryophyte was. But basically, think about mosses. This is a down log um, in the system that's covered almost 100% with moss. And you can see, oh, it's a little difficult, a bunch of native seedlings coming up. This is uh, Leptocophila pukiave. There's no hello. There's a, um, an olapa in there. And so these bryophytes seem to be really good recruitment sites. It's for these native plants in the system. 
So we wanted to look at that a little bit more closely. So we have a student um, from UH Manila working with us. Uh, he's actually coming over tomorrow to go collect some more samples, Miles Thomas. We wanted to look at how do bryophyte communities change as you move from the intact forest into these restoration areas. And do seedlings associate with these bryophytes? Are bryophytes good recruitment sites? As you can see, almost every time you see bryophytes, they're seedlings. So we went out and we sampled a bunch of trees um, in the intact forest. These were under ohias in the intact forest. And then a mix of those old ohias that are in the restoration area and the koas that are in those koa corridors. So we sampled all three of those habitats to look at bryophyte abundance, bryophyte identification, and how many seedlings are we finding in those bryophytes. What we find is that mean bryophyte coverage, so how much area is around the base of a tree that's covered in bryophyte, is highest in intact forest. So there's a lot of bryophytes under trees that are in those intact forests. When you move out into the restoration corridor, you start to see less and less bryophyte coverage, whether that's under an ohia or whether that's under a koa. What's also interesting is that we actually see more bryophytes under these remnant ohia than we do under the koa in the restoration area. Remember that this was all grass under those ohia 30 years ago, yet some Somehow they have more bryophytes under them than do the color. What we also see is that now we're looking at the percentage of bryophyte mats with seedlings present. So how often do we find bryophytes and they have a seedling in them? Well, in the intact forest, every time we find a bryophyte, we find a seedling. So this shows that they're really, really important as recruitment sites, even in the intact forest. Under the remnant ohia, a really high rate of having these seedlings occur in these bryophyte mats. In the koa, it's a little bit different. We don't see as many seedlings in those bryophyte mats. There's possibly two reasons for this. First of all, there's very few bryophytes in the koa, and second of all, there might be less seed coming in to actually land and grow in those bryophyte mats. But overall, we think that bryophytes are really important recruitment sites, especially in the restoration area, because it's not grass, and it can catch a seed, and they're moist, and it's just a good environment for a little seed to start growing and become an adult. So we're starting to show that there's probably a lack of plant establishment sites um, outside of grass. Harsh microclimate. We hear a lot about global warming with mean temperatures going up, and that's definitely a part of global climate change, but global climate change is broader than that. Uh, extreme temperatures are changing rapidly as well. This is both extreme high and extreme lows. This is typhoons, this is all sorts of things. So when we started thinking about potential changes to the microclimate that these seedlings are experiencing out in these restoration areas, I started to think about cold temperature. Because we're at mid-elevations, it gets pretty cold. It's below freezing almost every night. You can ask my, my technicians that I send out in the field at six in the morning. It's pretty freaking cold out there. This is long-term climate data starting in 2002 to 2019. This is up to date through March of this year from a climate station at Hakalau with our monthly maximum, mean, and minimum temperature map. It's a little bit hard to see, but if you squint, you can see mean temperatures are actually decreasing, or sorry, minimum temperatures are actually decreasing over time at Hakalau. Mean temperatures aren't really changing and neither are maximum temperatures, but minimum temperature is significantly getting colder. <coughs> this is probably due to shifts in the cloud base. When you don't have a cloud layer, layer you don't have the insulation effects of clouds, especially during winter. So a clear night without a lot of wind, standing in the open grassland is really cold. And the other thing about this is whenever you remove a forest, you remove the buffering effects of temperature that that canopy provides. Think about on a hot day, if you were to walk across a parking lot and into a forest, it's usually a lot cooler in that forest. So it buffers against the extreme high temperatures. The same thing at night. If it's cold out in the open grassland, it's probably a bit more warm in that forest because you have that insulating effect of those leaves and that canopy. Well, now we've removed that, at least in those open grasslands. So is the microclimate now too extreme that seedlings can't grow out there because it's either too hot or too cold? And this is we're focusing in on cold temperatures. We can actually test this. It's really easy to do these freezing assays. We take leaves off of plants. We put them into freezers at different temperatures and we pull them out, and then a lot of times you can visually assess at what temperature that plant tissue was killed. This is a, a species of pilo, 
It was killed around three and a half degrees, minus three and a half degrees Celsius. This is a species of Ohello that was killed around negative six and a half degrees Celsius. We do this for a lot of species, a lot of individuals across all those different species, and we can get community level understanding of which plants might be able to live in the open grassland. Three degrees Celsius difference in their ability to resist cold temperatures doesn't sound like a lot, but ecologically it's really important. We have a lot of temperature sensors out in the system getting fine detailed temperature data. And this is temperature data that's close to the ground where a little seedling is going to be growing. So in that pocket of air close to the ground is actually the coldest temperatures anywhere on the landscape due to radiative freezing and all these other things. So when we measure ground level temperature, which is where seedlings would be growing, we see that in those restoration corridors, cold temperatures, the coldest temperature we've recorded in just two years is only negative 1.9 degrees Celsius. That's not cold enough to kill any of the species we tested. They can all deal with that temperature down to negative two degrees. But in the open grassland, just literally 15 from here to that wall, you go from the forest to the open grassland, the coldest temperature I recorded in the last two years is now negative eight, so six degrees colder. And the majority of our species will die at that temperature, or their plant tissues will die at that, tissue, at that temperature. The only two species that can really deal with that is Vaccinium reticulatum, which is more of an open species <coughs> anyway. It's an ohello that's much more shrubby, and ohia. Again, species that aren't being used in the restoration project. I sort of half cross out the other ohello because some individuals can survive, others can't. So it's right on the cusp of being able to deal with those cold temperatures. This is temperature data from just two years. Negative eight is what I recorded. Over 10, 15 years, you probably get colder snaps than that. Negative 10, negative 11 degrees Celsius at ground level, which is at that point cold enough to kill Ohia, still not cold enough to kill Ohello. They can deal with about negative 13, negative 15. So it tells us that microclimate's been changed drastically, and it's probably climates that these plants have not really dealt with in the past. And so we know that a harsh microclimate is preventing expansion of, of understory plants, at least in that open grassland matrix. In the koa corridors, it's, it's pretty mild because you have that canopy of the koa. What about altered nutrient dynamics? Remember I said koa was a nitrogen fixer. Well, plants love nitrogen. It's one of the most uh, limiting nutrients for most plant growth, whether it's in your garden or whether it's in these forests. And there's two, a couple different pools of plant nitrogen. There's woody plant nitrogen, which is held in the woody uh, biomass, the trunks, the barks, the branches, that kind of stuff. It takes a long time for that nitrogen to decompose and become available to the plants again. The other pool of nitrogen is in the soil and in the litter that's on top of the soil or in the top layer of the soil. This is leaf litter, flower litter, uh, fruits that fall to the ground. There's a lot of nitrogen in there. And grass really like that nitrogen and they can really get to it quickly, a lot better than a lot of the native plants can get to it. So in the open grassland system, what we think is happening is there's not a lot of nitrogen held in those woody plant pools because there's not a lot of woody plants. But there's a lot of nitrogen in the soil and in the litter, which is really good for grass biomass. So it has a positive effect on that grass growth. When you move into the koa corridors, you see an increase in the amount of nitrogen in the woody plant material because there's actually woody plants there. But because they're nitrogen fixers, they're bringing nitrogen in via their roots into the soil. There's a lot more soil in the, there's a lot more nitrogen in soil in the litter fall, which again has a positive effect on grass biomass because they seem to be better at um, harvesting this nitrogen using it in their growth. When you go into the intact forest that's not coa dominated, which is the majority of the forest out there, we see a much bigger woody plant nitrogen pool and a much smaller pool in the soil and in the litter which this now has a negative effect on grass biomass and a positive effect on the understory woody plant. And so the fact that we're using koa in restoration is creating this really nitrogen rich environment that the grasses really thrive in and the native plants can't really compete there. So the intact forest is probably a much better system for those plants in terms of nitrogen dynamics. The last thing I'm gonna to touch on is the lack of correct mycorrhizae or the potential lack of correct mycorrhizae. I'm not a fungal biologist. I'm not a mycorrhizae person. So I'm going to stumble through this and bear with me. This is being done by our colleagues at UH Manoa, Nicole Hinson and Cam Egan. Um, they're doing a lot. Uh, they're doing the sampling for this and doing the data analysis. A one click slide for dummies like me who know nothing about fungus. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about mycorrhizae. It's fungal communities that are living in the soil. 
And what they do is they have a symbiosis with the roots of the plants, in this case, our native woody plants. They penetrate into those roots and they're getting carbon products from the plants because the plants are photosynthesizing, creating sugars, creating carbon products. In return, the fungus are sending out hyphae in this huge network of stuff through the soil where it can harvest nutrients, it can harvest water, bring it back to the, new, back to the roots for those woody plants. They give it to the woody plants, the woody plants give them carbon. So it's a really nice symbiosis. And these symbiosis, this symbiosis exists everywhere in the world almost. Every woody plant has fungal associates. Some are more specialized than others, but usually if you have your fungal associates, you're a much healthier plant than if you don't. And this is what they actually look like. This is uh, microscopic pictures. You can see the plant root here. These little pink things are the, are the fungus uh, uh, within that plant root, as well as here, here's your plant root and little nodules that are the fungus that are out in the soil doing a lot of this harvesting work. <clears throat> what we think might have happened is, is that when the native forest was removed and cattle grazing occurred for 100 years and non-native plants were brought in, all the native fungus that was in the soil was lost because they no longer had their symbiotic partners, which were the, the native woody plants. So we bring in these invasive plants, which are invasive grasses, and now there's this invasive fungus in the soil, or they're invasive associates in the soil. So far, we've been trying to restore above ground native plants, and we've been planting native plants out on that landscape, but we haven't necessarily addressed this issue that maybe their symbionts aren't there. Maybe the fungus that they need to be healthy individuals doesn't exist on that landscape. So we might want to think about below ground restoration as well where we now start inoculating soils or plants that are going into the soils with these important symbionts that they had historically and that might not be there. This is all ongoing. Um, we, the, the preliminary analysis data that we have from this lab at UH Manoa is showing us that yes, the communities in the restoration corridor and the intact forest are different in terms of their fungal communities. We just haven't identified it yet. And they're really hard to identify because you know, most, uh, most fungus in the world hasn't been identified. So I don't know if we'll ever get to that taxonomic resolution, but at least we know they're different communities. And we can start to think about functionally, what does that mean for these plants? So we started to build all this um, evidence that there's multiple barriers preventing overall community restoration in these native forests. And we can start to point at things that may be able to remediate some of this issue. First of all, we should exist those big old lohias that occur on the landscape. They're really, they're, they're good nuclei for native plant recruitment. We start to see little halos forming around those ohias of native woody plants that hopefully over time might expand. We should think about using ohia and other species in restoration. Let's get away from koa. If your goal is to restore the entire community, well, it's not necessarily working here in Hakalau. So if we can start to put different plants on the landscape, we might be able to jumpstart succession even faster. We need to reduce grass cover. That's not surprising. We all know that. Um, we could think about maybe alternative ways to restoration, things that we don't normally think about, like below ground restoration. But overall, what we know now is that these corridors that exist out on this landscape are probably going to be pretty slow to expand. And, and we're not going to get this coalescing and, and expansion of native forests throughout this entire system like we had originally hoped to. And so what we're doing is we've moved on. We're moving forward now to try to come up with possible solutions for some of these problems. And so we're starting a study now where we're looking at different herbicides and vegetation clearing, where we're um, spraying plots and then removing the vegetation. This is within a coa corridor here. Here is Dave, our fearless crew leader with the weed whacker. And you can see um, other folks coming in and raking away that biomass of dead grass. And then over time, we clean out these plots and get it down to not necessarily bare soil, but ground level. And that the hope is that any seed of a native plant that might be in that seed bank might be able to grow once that grass biomass is gone. We can give it a jump start. That grass biomass is going to come back probably in two or three years, depending on the herbicide we use. But is that enough time to get those seedlings growing, get those other native understory plants into that system so that it can start a positive feedback loop and start to bring other native plants, and other native birds, and other native wildlife in there as well. We can get back to a more community level restoration instead of just having coal forest out there. So I'll stop with that and um, happy to take any questions if anybody has any.
and I thank you for your time. Yeah, as far as I know, and, and why that work hasn't necessarily been done, but in Costa Rica, in similar elevation and system, it's been done to show that, yeah, if you're planting in circles with a lot of dense plants, they tend to have a lot better recruitment and can get rid of that grass a lot quicker than long linear features, um, mainly because they can start to get a much denser canopy. And once it gets dark enough, then you start to lose that grass out of there naturally. So it's, it's, a, it's a great point that if you start to change your configuration of how you do planting, you can start to get better recruitment depending on the system you're in. I think that would probably hold here. We see that in denser planted areas, we start to see the grass be reduced, which has a potential then for those native plants to be able to establish. Yep. Will it start the patient bring in a big cat and just plow the grass away because all the pole comes up real quick when you do that? Yeah, I, I think um, I haven't been in the system that long, so I don't necessarily know if that's been done. I think it's been done in the system. Um, you get a lot of root suckers there. You get a lot of koa. I don't know if those necessarily turn into adult trees um, because the data we have from the freezing tolerance work shows that it gets too cold and a lot of those koas die. Um, so it might have to be in a specific topographic location that's not exactly super cold. Uh, but that is one potential way to work. And I think that some of that was done back in the 80s of just testing that out and for whatever reason it, it, it didn't. They didn't pursue that. Yeah. Yep. Possibly could, uh, could it be that you need to give the, the forest a little more time to regenerate? The reason I'm, I'm asking this question is because I spent about five years up there mowing the interior roads and their fire breaks. And I noticed that around the drip line of a lot of the planted corn, there's tons of baby corns coming up. And I'm just wondering if you gave the forest a little more time, would it regenerate through that uh, the baby boys as they get larger, and they uh, drop their seeds and then they grow and then they drop their seeds and over time, you know, if you gave it a lot more time, it would kind of take care of itself. Yeah, so I think if we were patient, that could happen. The baby cores you're talking about are all root suckers though. They're not from seed. We follow those back and they're still connected to the adult plant. But it is growth and it is creating shade. Um, if we're patient and wait two, three hundred years, this would probably turn back into a forest. The problem is with climate change, this is a really good habitat for birds to go into where avian malaria is really low and the birds can persist. That's going to be gone in 50, 60 years probably because it's going to be too warm there and the mosquito populations are going to start persisting and you're going to have avian malaria all the time. And unless the birds themselves get resistance to that, then we've just created a forest that's empty of birds because the avian malaria is killing them. It could be really good for the plants, but you don't have the whole community system there. But you're, you're absolutely right. If we were, as a species patient, and had trajectories and out to two or three hundred years instead of management plans out of five or ten years, we could probably get there by just leaving it go. Yeah. In the back? Yeah, so um, the work that's being done now at Fish and Wildlife is they're growing a lot of plants on site from local seed stock. So that should be the best plants to grow there. As far as I know, I don't know if there's any microbial <laughs> fungal work going on. Um, but the focus now is planting understory plants out there that potentially have that symbiont there, but they're grown from seeds and not necessarily from soil from other sites because of contamination issues like rod and everything else. But you could potentially pull soil from the intact forest and inoculate it into your growth medium and maybe that's good enough. Again, I don't know much about that. Yeah. Yeah. Why are the native plants not harmed by the herbicide you use? Why are they not affected? Uh, well, we didn't spray on um, small seedlings. We, we avoided those. We, there's some understory plants that were planted maybe 10 years ago, which are now big enough that they're, under, they're understory trees. So we can spray around the 
the base of them, and they're not going to be harmed. The seedlings that are that are potentially there, we don't really know if we're harming them or not. This is why we're trying out different herbicides. One that we've tried is supposed to not harm seeds that are in the soil, but is supposed to harm grass. What we see is when we sprayed it, it didn't kill a lot of the grass. So it's not necessarily the best herbicide to get rid of the grass, but if it lets the seeds live, it's great. The other one is kind of like a scorched earth policy where it just kills everything. That's why we're doing small plots and trying to test this out. Yeah. Yeah. So your, your restoration area is adjacent to a intact native forest. So my question is, are your, are your conclusions valid for an area where you don't have an intact? And I guess I'm, I'm thinking that the birds that come and carry seeds would come from your intact forest. So if you don't have an intact forest, Jason, you don't have birds. So yeah, so you're talking about like trying to establish a forest way away, like in a grassland or a gorse area or something like that. Yeah, it would. Yeah, so I think what we're ta what we're talking about here is under the assumption that having that intact forest, the intact forest there is really good because, like you said, birds are bringing seeds in. You could potentially get um, uh, bryophyte spores in the air, which could come in. You can get fungal symbionts coming in, even brought in by non-native ungulates or something like that. So having the intact forest there is kind of key to this. And as well, if we think about long-term trajectory and why this was started to begin with, it was to give those birds a place to go as a refuge away from avian malaria. Well, birds aren't necessarily gonna move vast distances over the landscape to seek out a forest either. So having it next to the intact forest creates a connectivity there that the birds can then come and go much more easily than if it was pretty far off. Yeah. yeah. Having volunteered there since 1992, I know about 10 or 15 years ago that Baron um, Horiuchi started using um, mycorrhizae from soil from intact coal forest to mix with the soil that was being used for planting seeds. And um, I don't know that that's been done for any other plants, but that obviously is the mycorrhizal concept that you're talking about. And I'm wondering whether if there was more intensive work on getting mycorrhizal soil from the intact forest into the seed planting operation, whether that might help. Yeah, I don't think it could hurt at this point. Um, the, the mycorrhizal network in those open grasslands is probably geared towards grass. Mm -hmm. And so any sort of specialization symbiont that's endemic to this area, that's specific to that understory plant, would almost be necessary for those plants to survive and thrive. So more work on that, not even the management side, but just to understand what the mycorrhizae look like in these different systems is desperately needed, but it's a really understudied area. Yeah. So who at Manoa is working on the mycorrhizae? Uh, Nicole Hinson. And then her postdoc, Cam Egan. Yeah. Yep. Is there any discussion of using gene editing to get rid of the mosquitoes? That is outside of my wheelhouse. <laughs> I'm assuming, yes, I'm assuming it, it is. Uh, I, I don't know much about it. But. Yeah. So, bryophytes, are you using, what, are, what kind of ideas are you just having to like, get those around or putting logs in? <laughs> I don't, yeah, we haven't really thought that far ahead. We are, um, we can't even ID these things. The, the last good identification guide was from like 1947. Um, so now we're working with somebody at UC Berkeley who's going to help us try to identify these things and probably come up with a lot new species. Um, in terms of increasing bryophyte abundance, we see a lot under those Remnohia that are out there, so we know that they can invade and get into those grass systems. It's probably more because those remnants here have the structure for bryophytes to be on. That's what he um, faces that are really funky. Whereas the, most of the coves are just straight up and down. They branch a lot more off the ground, but they don't have much ground in the structure. Um, so yeah, something like logs, down woody debris, and, and maybe this will happen naturally. As these coa trees get bigger and bigger, they start to drop branches and they start to die. They may be falling over, creating rooting habitat. But the danger there is that if they don't create that rooting, well, you've lost that color and you've had nothing to replace it. I, I don't know what the long term plan it would be for biophytes just to sort of do us even thinking about, it, at least new for me. Yeah. Does the prospect of broad preclude the idea of replanting a via either by seed or by any other means? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Because um, there's plenty of seed stock there. You could you could plant from seed that's coming from which is pretty rod-free, maybe completely rod-free as far as I know. 
Um, and I don't know if we're necessarily seed limited with Ohia because it's wind dispersed. Those canopies probably produce millions of seeds. There's probably Ohia seed everywhere. Um, it's more about creating the site for them to be able to grow. Barron is doing some outplanting with, with Ohia. It does occur. But I think most of that's grown from seed on that site. So transplanting seedlings from other areas, then you get into pollination. You've been very patient. <laughs> Would it work to have grazing animals to handle some of the grass, or would that just cause more problems? Uh, I, uh, I might not answer that. I, <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. Um, they, they're they really good at ungulate control in Hakalau. There's still some pigs around, but it's really low density. Um, when we do see pig damage, it's pretty severe. Even though there's, I don't know, only a couple dozen pigs in that whole area, when they get into an area, they'll kill every seedling that's in there, just rooting them up, rolling around, carrying it out. But they also do root up some of that grass and create exposed soil. So I don't really know a good answer for that. Big ungulates like cows, you know, we know that that's a bad thing. But the small ungulates, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about You mean, mean the, um, Just in your area. how much has come back naturally? Um, well, I know that work has been put into it to support it, but is there some specific back right now? I don't know if it's, it's not all naturally to be back right now. We're helping, but is there a growth rate, you know, percentage wise? Uh, I would say, so the question was, um, is there some sort of tracking over time how much forest growth is happening in these restoration areas? Um, as far as I know, no, we don't really have that data. We'd like to, we could derive that from aerial imagery and do it over time based on pictures we have starting back to when it grows. But as far as I know, the trees are growing up, they're becoming adults, but we're not seeing any other plants really coming in naturally. There's some here and there, but not at the scale you'd like to see. So, Growth rate wise, I don't know, it's probably over fast how it grows is what in that system. Yeah. What's happening on the uh, intact forest pasture margin where there's maybe more connectivity to an intact ecosystem, but without the restoration of these occurring, is the grass still arresting uh, some kind of uh, restoration or is it is the forest naturally moving up in the absence of the yeah, to some extent, the forest is, it was a little bit more fragmented down there. It wasn't cleared as heavily. And I personally think grazing was a little bit lower there as well. I don't know if that's actually true. Um, so there was a lot, I think there was more Ohia there in terms of remnant trees than the further away you move from that fence line. So it was a better start. And the fact that there was a lot of Ohia there instead of coal was also a better start. So we're starting to see a lot more understory development. There is a lot more diversity of plants down there. You still have pockets of grass in these fragmented forests that don't really seem to be, um, have native plants recruiting in them. It's a lot of Rubus arbutus, uh, the invasive raspberry, and a lot of the invasive grasses. That said, those could potentially be closing over time from the outside. We just need to be patient like we talked about before. But it's definitely, a, a, it seems to be a healthier system and it's mimicking the intact forest much better down there than it is further away. Yeah. You looked at like five or six different factors that you thought might be affecting this. How did you decide on those particular uh, Intuition? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the work that is done before I got here with uh, Stephanie Yelena, who's here in green, and Carla D'Antonio, my postdoc advisor at UC Santa Barbara, they've been working in this system for a long time. Um, and so I think they've been able to pull information from other sites what's preventing things from growing here, what's preventing things from growing there. And then some of it is, you know, I've worked in a lot of other tropical systems in Peru and the Mariana Islands and Puerto Rico to try to bring in those lessons as well to think, you know, micro to me, microclimate was one that was missing from our original project design because we're at mid elevation, it gets really cold and most tropical plants aren't good at dealing with the cold. And so it's just sort of a, a, a conglomerate of all of our different ideas, but a lot of it was already there when I came. Yep. Uh, could you comment on um, rapid ohia death and how it's affected your research? Uh, I don't 
personally work on Rod's stuff at all. Um, so I, I can't really comment on that because um, as far as I know, I don't know if Rod is in Hakalau or not. I, I don't think it is. Um, so we don't really think about it beyond cleaning our vehicles, cleaning our stuff, and not moving materials around within Hakalau. But beyond that, I'm not, I'm not on the Rod side of things. Sorry. It's not there yet. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's probably going to get, and a big part of that's because we don't have a lot of ungulates harming the trees, creating wounds that then Rod can get into, I think is a big part of that as well. Mm -hmm. What is the composition of the native extent of existing seed banks beneath the cocoon grass, if anything? Yeah, we also don't have a good handle on that. We pulled some, um, we pulled soil samples from where we're doing this herbicide and grass removal project to start to see if um, there's any seed in the soil under the largest pilos and the largest ohelos that are out on that landscape. And so we're just starting that now. We have those seed trays out trying to germinate. We are seeing germination of the native plants in that seed bank. In most tropical systems, Seed banks don't persist very long. Um, the seeds tend to die pretty quickly, except for a couple species can live a long time. Um, so I would suspect, especially in the grassland area, that it's been grazed for 200 years, 150 years, there's no seed out there and you're starting fresh from whatever's coming. Yeah? You mentioned that there was Could you talk a little bit about potential for Cohen to have a little bit of Yeah, so um, you know, things like uh, from the leaf litter, you mean from the like, tannins? And... Yeah, so so the phyllodes of, of Koa could hold compounds that prevent other things from growing. Um, I don't know if bryophytes are affected by that or not. Um, I think the bryophyte aspect is more because there's not the structure. You have a lot of vertical structures, which a lot of bryophytes won't grow on. Lichens will, but they, that's not necessarily a good place for plants to grow. Other vascular plants where um, Barron has done the outplanting, if you plant it in the ground and it's this big when you put it in, it grows and it does fine. So I don't think the co are necessarily preventing it once it's at that stage, when it's at a seed or a little seedling stage, I don't know. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you.